Hi, I'm Chuang. Thanks for dropping by my channel, which is about doing business, investing wisely, and being the best version of yourself. So today I talked to this guy called Pankaj Kumar. He works, has worked as a buy side analyst and a sell side analyst, and he talks to me about making good uh, share market decisions, and also shares with me some life lessons. If you like this video, please uh, tell me what you think in the comments below. Uh, share it, and uh, thanks for coming by. <laughs> Mr. Pankaj Kumar, <laughs> how are you bro? I'm good, John. We've known each other, what, 20 years? I think um, so. <laughs> I've known you as a head of research at OSK. Yes, correct. I've known you as a chief investment officer of, of Konya. Yeah. And then you join the family uh, after that, Yeah. in charge of the family office. Yeah. Correct. But then you've left. You've yeah. left the investment world. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you straight off the bat mm. by asking you um, whether there's, there's a proposition for younger people nowadays to still enter the investment world as an analyst? I think so. I mean, the world of being an analyst is still a, a very much a demanding role. And of course, you know, if young people, if you talk about if they are well qualified, especially with the CFA, uh, you know, uh, qualification, and if they have interest in the market, especially analyzing uh, stocks and market, yeah, it's, it's an exciting world, really. I mean, you get to, you get to understand what market is all about. You got to you got to cover some companies in terms of your research work. You got to see the companies, you know, the CA, the CEOs or the owners of the companies. You know, you got to rub shoulders in a way. Yeah, that helps you a lot to understand what's happening in a particular industry or the business or the direction. Yeah, so you really learn along the way. Uh, when while you're being an analyst, you learn along the way how to run a business actually. Yeah, because back in the 80s and 90s, yeah. the go-to kind of job for people entering the financial market was to be an analyst, right? Yes, correct. Because it was damn hot shit in those days, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but today, but today, I mean, it's it's so different, right? Um, most young people they would have no idea how a short share market works. They would probably be investing in cryptos, maybe. Correct. Or ECF or P2P or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, so, so it, it is still a form of investment. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about that, those are basically like investment classes. Yeah. But equity, if you talk about equity, uh, it again boils down to uh, self-interest. If you have passion for it, if you are interested in a particular subject matter, like for example, in, in my case, I mean, of course, I, I understood markets at a very young age. Why is that? Uh, family influence. Yeah. Your father so, also reminds you? Uh, no, he's... <laughs> He's an investor himself, you know. So, okay. so in a way, he taught a few of us, you know, how to understand what stock market was all about. So, at a very young age, in fact, I think I remember as early as twelve years old. Yeah, uh, I begin to understand what stock market was all about. That was the same age what Warren Buffett was when he bought Coca Cola, right? So, t tell me about your father. What, what was he? Well, he's just a businessman running a furniture shop in a small town in in Tampin in Greece, Milan. Yeah, uh, but uh, to to sustain himself in terms of growing his money, uh, he developed the passion of understanding stock market. So and his thing investing. Was, his thing was the share market. His what? His thing was the share yeah, market. Yeah, to a certain extent. Well, you know, business come business is not that busy. Yeah, so he got involved in markets, and he started to invest in companies that are listed. You know, of course, those days, I mean, we are in a small town. The nearest biggest town was Malacca. Yeah, so we. He used to have an account in a, one of the Malacca securities firm, yeah, uh, through Arimizia. So he gets ideas into how to invest and what to invest, you know. And that knowledge was slowly uh, uh, given to us as well, uh, so the children. How did he talk to you about it? Did he, did he involve you in the analysis process? Did he tell you how much money he made or lost? Uh, he, did, he did, he did. He told me what he bought. And then I asked him, what do you buy? You know, then he tell me, oh, this company does so and so. Then I said, how do you know? He said, you, you read about the companies in the newspaper. In those days, you know, things were, information was not easily available like today. Yeah? But those days, much of the information was through the newspaper. Yeah? So you read newspaper a lot and you understand what the companies are doing. And of course, you could only know how well or how bad the companies are doing only maybe once a year. You know, because reporting those days, uh, was kind of opaque. Yeah, you didn't have really uh, listing requirements and all that. Yeah, so investment was very uh, uh, like just on top of superficial. Yeah, superficial. Yeah, so, so you didn't really had the opportunity to analyze really. 
So how did he get your interest in it growing? Was it inherent to you or did he kind of like give you the passion? Mm, well, my passion started because I wanted to understand what he was doing. All right? In terms of why is he buying a particular stock or who told him. I asked him, how do you get this information? He tells me, oh, the Remisier tells him, so and so. All right? Then say, oh, this stock is going to go up and don't know what not. Yeah? Then I said, how do you keep track? He said, oh, you read at the newspaper. All right? So that's how my passion started in terms of understanding stock market. I started to read at the age of 12. I started to read the newspapers, the stock market pages. No way. <laughs> really? I, I'm not joking. I, that's what I did. You know, I started to read because in those days, the newspapers will summarize, will not only give you the prices of the stocks, they will tell you, oh, at what price the stocks were traded during the day, the range of the that's prices right. and that's all right. that. Yeah. Yeah? So I started to read those. Then I, I began to be more interested because at a very young age, in fact, most of us, were very numbered based. You know, we were, we were taught to be good at numbers, maths. And to me, it was accounting as well. All right? So my passion started to that, started from that. And I wanted to do accounting from a very young age itself. Because as I said, my father uh, used to own some of these companies in terms of the shares and all that. So he received the annual report. Then I started to read annual reports. Did he ever keep them all this time, like 30 Anola. years, like public bank and all these things? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cut public bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, we know that story. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, but those annual reports gave me uh, the first-hand information in terms of what you need to read or to understand when you talk about companies that are listed. Yeah, so I developed that passion very early age. And by the time I was in Form 4, I started to, or Form 3, I think, you know, we, we had the option to take accounting subjects. Yeah, so from there, I, I began my, my interest in understanding the numbers even better. Okay. Yeah. So there's kind of two kinds of analysts broadly, right? Yeah, there's yeah. what you call the sell side analysts. Yeah, correct. Who, who tell people, oh, buy, sell, or hold. Yeah, correct. And then there's the, um, sorry, so there's the sell side analyst, yes, right? Yes, correct. And then there's the buy side analyst yes. where she used the money from the fund to go and, well, invest well, in the share market, well, right? Well, right? Well, you're right on the sell side. On the yeah. buy side analyst basically collates information from the sell side. Yeah. yeah and basically passes, acts on it. Yeah, and acts on it in terms of recommending, you know, so that, uh, internally to say that these are the good stocks to invest, for example. Yeah? But the fund manager, uh, normally some fund managers, they double up as an analyst as well, but some don't. Yeah? Some, they are advised by the analyst to what to do in terms of uh, strategizing uh, how to manage the portfolio, for example. Yeah? So I think the sell side, being a sell side analyst is a bit more demanding yeah? because you really need to know your stuff. Uh, in terms of analyzing the numbers historically and then of course uh, forecasting. Uh, forecasting is an art, as you know, yeah. Uh, it depends on a lot of variables uh, and of course your level of understanding, uh, whether it's the industry itself or the companies in the industry, uh, who is number one, who is number two, what are the differentiating factors, yeah, what drives the company's earnings, is the company's management uh, hands-on, you right? Know, are the other management trustworthy yeah so all these will come into play so you learn a lot when you are in the sales side analyst yeah in terms of uh, understanding the company and understanding the industry and forecasting so for the younger person 25 to 35 right? right which is the most rewarding not just in terms of knowledge but also in terms of remuneration because traditionally right traditionally I think it was the sell side, right? Yes, I, correct. Well, I, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's always been the sell side. Yeah, uh, but of course the hours <coughs> are a bit more demanding. Yeah? yeah, once you're on the sell side. And four times a year, you got to work like hell, right? Yeah, now it's four times a year. Yeah, yeah because of quarterly reporting. Yeah, uh, and of course depending on um, the timing of the results announcement. Yeah, I mean I have gone through times where uh, I had to work twenty four hours even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's part and parcel of being a sell side analyst. So, which one would you recommend now, still, even in this day and I age? I think to build your career, uh, be a sell side analyst first, all right? That will give you the, the strength in terms of your knowledge, in terms of your analytical ability, uh, as well as recommending, yeah? Because a sell side analyst uh, puts its head on the chopping block in terms of his call, whether it's a buy, a sell, uh, or even the target price. Yeah, but you see, there's a thing called herd instinct, right? Yeah, I yeah. very rarely see one analyst like going, you know, sell. Against the grind. Yeah, and then everybody is buy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I rarely see that. 
and, and the one guy that was on the other side like, what the hell is he doing? Why is he all out there by himself, right? Yeah, to give you an example, I remember those days uh, uh, when I used to cover the gaming sector yeah. and one of the companies that was listed was Tanjung PLC. Yes. Do you remember that one? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it was of course taken private. Uh, and I remember Tanjung was like a darling stock because it has very good corporate governance, good dividends. But I found the valuation was to be too high. And I was the only one out there. Everyone's calling a buy or hold. I'm calling a sell. Right. So, so then did, you get, did you get a call from the owner? I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the owner is very famous, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Call. I, I mean, even until today, uh, the CFO then still remembers me, you know, because of that, because yeah. of my sell call. All right. So sometimes you not necessary to be, you know, with what every, uh, everybody else is saying, all right? But if you can justify a reason why you should sell, why not, all right? If the valuations are kind of peak, obviously you got to call a sell already. I mean, I remember one of the things that I do today is writing, yeah? yeah? And one of the things that I wrote sometime last year was about the glove sector, all right? And you know, it's hot today because of the virus and all that. Uh, but even a year ago, the glove sector was trading at ridiculous multiples. You know, it was trading like 30 times PE. How do you keep calling a buy on a sector that's trading at 30 times multiple? And true enough, if you look at the performance of the glove sector, okay, of course they have performed pretty well in the past one and a half months or maybe past couple of weeks. But in 2019, the healthcare sector was one of the sector that actually corrected. Yeah, so stock price actually came off quite a bit yeah? because overvaluation. Yeah. Okay, so let's not talk about Malaysia, right? Let's just put, get you to put on your um, analyst hat for now, right? Ah. And uh, don't look at Malaysia. Malaysia's been in the basket case for like ages, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we will talk about Malaysia, right? Uh, but America. America last year, for all fund managers around the world, I think, could not beat the index. Yeah. Right? I think the S&P was like 30% or something. The NASDAQ was like 35%. Yeah. I mean, if you're like an active fund manager trying to beat the index, Bloody hell, man. Your job is damn tough. Yeah, damn tough. Damn tough, Damn right? tough, yes. Um, nobody expected the Federal Reserve to, um, to, to cut to interest hike, rates. To, to cut interest rates, right? But yep. they did three times. Yep. Um, so where, <laughs> how do you call the market today? Uh, Apple is at $1.4 trillion. We have um, many multiple... Microsoft is we at, have, I don't know what. We Microsoft have many is. trillion dollar companies today. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, if you are a fund manager in the US in 2019, you would have probably outperformed if you had just a few stocks. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, how, how it was, can you? How can you? Yeah, well, you can't. You you, yeah. you you can you potentially can't because you, can't. you have internal restrictions yeah. as to how much you can potentially own on a particular company. Yes. Right. So that restricts you to a certain extent. Yeah. So well, you asked me the question about what do I see the market today? Yeah, because that's, it's all of, that's the source, right? That, yeah, that's what, that's what, what dictates your salary. Yeah, correct. But one of the things that is driving the markets today it's liquidity, right? As you can see, liquidity has been created by the Fed. Uh, especially since uh, late September, you know, you had a crisis in the US about the overnight market, overnight money market, rates went up and the Fed started to provide some liquidity and Fed continued to provide this liquidity into the market. In fact, right until second quarter of this year. So this liquidity is driving markets, all right? So at the end of it, while we have issues related to whether it's viruses, slowing economy, Trade war, I mean, of course, that's... It's, it's going to come to an end, right? So, the, the everybody... Yeah, yeah, so we asking... are in a situation where we call, like, everything is a bubble. Yeah. Yeah, we are creating a bigger bubble, uh, and the bubble is just getting bigger and bigger. Okay, so this is beautiful, right? Because you no longer work in the industry. Yeah. yeah no. You are not beholden to your bosses and their whims anymore. No. <laughs> you are managing your own money. I, I'm... I'm just, uh, well, I, I give my ideas. I give no, no, my... No. no, so you yourself, Pankaj Kumar. yeah, yeah. yeah. What are you doing with your money? Well, I do invest, yeah, but uh, not much, as much as I have, you know, so I do what I can, yeah. But if you ask me the question, where, what should I do? If yeah, I because have, everybody seeks a return. Yeah, so I would, I would need to hide myself, you know, in a market like this, I hide myself. Where do I hide? All right, I hide in, in stocks that give me good dividends, all right? For example, REITs, yeah, those are the ones that See, are that's stable. The problem. See, that's the problem, right? To go a bit deeper, right? In order to um, have continuing dividends, the REITs must have the continuing tenancy tenants yep. who are paying rental correct. according to the terms of the agreement. Correct, correct. If business is bad, no more business, 
No more rental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> agree. I mean, then that, that's where your analytical part comes in. You know, you got to see which sector is these REITs exposed to. Are they uh, retail REITs? Are they office REITs? Are they uh, hospitality REITs? Or are they industrial REITs? So you're hiding the REITs now? Uh, I think that's the right choice at the moment uh, because of the factors that we see in the market. And I think you could at least generate a decent yield, uh, maybe 5 or 6% thereabouts. Uh, and if you're lucky, you get a little bit of capital appreciation. Yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, maybe some of the consumer names, but with the current market situation, a bit tough. Do you put your money at, at all abroad outside of Malaysia? Uh, not personal, personally. Personal, no, 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 not personally. Any reason? Because if you hadn't for the last 10 years, you would have lost out on this yeah, huge opportunity. Yeah, I agree. Opportunity, I agree. Yeah, right? I agree. I mean, Apple went from like 500 billion to 1.4 trillion. I know, I know. Right? I know. <laughs> what the hell, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really. Uh, so for me, I was very much uh, into the local market. Uh, I didn't really invest outside. Uh, but I did do some investment in the sense that uh, through uh, external fund managers, yeah, uh, you have asset managers yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. So those like will basically help you in terms of uh, allocating yourself for, for external uh, outside Malaysia. Yeah. So, so, t- 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 so tell me what it's like. Um, what are the considerations you have <clears throat> when you pick a stock? What are the three most important considerations for you when you pick a, when you try to spot the next big thing? Growth, dividend, and management. In that order? Uh, Which is the most important? Well, first of all, of course, it's got to be the right industry, all right? Yeah, it has to be a sector that is of going in the right direction is growing yeah and you pick the stock that has that market presence in that sector and of course then you got to look whether are they continuing to grow uh, in terms of their management style in terms of their direction in terms of their ability to capture market share right so that would be which industries are growing now very good question because at the moment as you can see very little uh, oh well, Bank Negara just released what quarter <coughs> GDP numbers, yeah. yeah, disappointingly at just 3.6%. Uh, this is going to invite a lot of downgrades, way below, way below expectations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think first quarter 2020 is basically like a write-off uh, with the virus thing and with us uh, coming from, from the slowing economy in the fourth quarter itself. Uh, sentiment is kind of uh, uh, down at the moment, yeah. Uh, so that is going to impact a lot of sectors. All right, not just the retail sectors, not just the consumer sector, uh, even our exporters are affected, you know, because as you can see what's happening in China today, uh, uh, all this is going to play out uh, in the market. And I think um, the, the direction given by the central bank uh, today, uh, I think they are quite open. Uh, we're going to see rate cuts going, com- coming forward. Yeah, so that's so kind of good, um, but yeah, the rate cuts is correct. good. It's, it's only good if it, it if it uh, if it attracts whether it's investors or consumers either to invest or spend. Yeah, right. If, if they do it own, if yeah. the sentiment is weak, that's right. any rate cuts not going to help. So where do you spot the growth industries now? Well, the market is tough at the moment. <laughs> yeah, as I said, uh, in fact, I thought uh, the the well plantation sector has been quite down last year. Uh, it has picked up a bit. CPU prices are up. But the problem is that production is down. <laughs> yeah. So then you have production down, but prices up at the end of it, where do you go? Property market is not doing well. Uh, banks, I thought 2020 would be better, but with now expectations, rate cut is going to come in. You know, stock prices has been coming off as well. All right. So I find that some of the exporters uh, will continue to gain uh, attention in the market. Um, I think they would mu- do much better uh, despite what's happening in China. Yeah, okay, so, so, so generally to try and spot an industry which is growing, yeah. um, to spot a company which pays you a good dividend, yeah. and to have a good management team. Yeah. Is that the toughest part, to find a good manager? Because there's a lot of corporate governance issues yeah. in, in, in smaller markets, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you know who's telling the truth and how do you know? Well, uh, I think if you, when you're analyzing a company, the historical perspective will tell you whether the company's governance issues has been clean 
or has it been compromised? Yeah, that that basically gives you an idea. Previous yeah. transactions, whether it's related party transactions or whether, you know, if uh, the management or the board uh, has compromised minority interests, for example, all right, those are red flags. Yeah, but if they are clean or they have been always been open in terms of, you know, what they say and what they do yeah, in terms of their, their performance and their terms of uh, their dividend payouts and all that, then you can see the company has rich valuations. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's look at a company like DG or even Maxis, for example. All right? Rich valuations. They are still trading like 20 times PE multiples, but you see them at a very steady level when it comes to their stock prices. Stock prices. Yeah? Dividend, decent, not exciting, but decent. All right? But the governance part plays a role in terms of that valuation. You see? You see the difference. Whereas if you look at some other stocks in the telco sector, you will see that perhaps investors are a bit more wary about it. Yeah? They can trade at a slightly lower multiple because of governance issues or potential governance issues. So you used to do a lot of company visits. Yeah. Do you used to rub shoulders with the owners? Mm, to a certain of extent. Course, right? yeah. You used to meet them, right? Yeah. The owners are their top guys, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, when you look at them in the eye, right, and when you talk to them, right, how can you tell they're on or off? Chuang, anybody that you meet, especially owners of any company, everyone tell you the, the, they paint you all the positive part or positive aspects of their company, right? Nobody's going to tell you anything that's negative. The, quest, the test comes when the quarterly results are released. All right. Okay, but that's too late because you got to make a call beforehand, <laughs> right? How do yeah, you sometimes you discount what you discount what the guy tells you. You know, I mean, if you say, "Oh, my company is expected to grow ten percent," but you know, the industry that you're covering, the industry is kind of mature. What are the telltale signs of good and bad things for you? Because you have to read human behavior. Because yeah, yeah, at the end yeah. of the day. The market is all about human behavior. Yeah, There's yeah, only three true. emotions, right? Yeah, yeah. Two, greed or fear. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That is yeah, it, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so the, 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 when you are posing the questions to management, whether it's the IR guy or the CEO or the CFO, uh, he will basically paint a picture in terms of the, where the company is, where the company is going, all right? And in terms of growth, what are the factors that's going to drive, you know, whether it's a new business or whether it's a new, seg new segment or new new market, all right? Then you ask yourself whether it's reasonable, right? If these are not reasonable, obviously you're not going to factor into your forecast, all right? Or you discount that, that factor, right? Yeah, but that's not enough. Then this is the problem, you see. If you look at the analyst today, especially, I mean, in the last few years, every time, whether it's December, January, uh, December going into January of a year, you will see, forecasts being made by market, you know, by, 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 by brokers. Everybody comes up with very high numbers. Yeah, expectations are always like, oh, we expect earnings growth to be 7% this year or 8% for that matter. Yeah, but, but it but doesn't come it, in. But goes beyond the numbers, goes beyond your read of the industry. Yeah. How can you tell that the owner or the CFO is going to go and put some money in his pocket after buying an, an aeroplane? Or how would you tell if, if you <laughs> the can't, company, you can't, you can't you right? Can't. So th that all comes down to reading the individual. Yeah, right? yeah. but sometimes... How do you read the individual? Yeah, there's so much you can read, yeah, but much of it will come in terms of what happens thereafter, right? Whether it's in the quarterly results or whether it's in governance issues, if it prop up, props up, right? And of course, then your level of trust on that company reduces, right? Because, hey, this guy told me so and so, but it's something else, right? Then, you know, you lose that, that trust from the market. So trust is very important. Yeah? So I always tell a lot of corporates that while you are being honest about your company's business and operations, try not to paint too rosy of a picture, you know, because if you're going to paint a too rosy of a picture and analysts are going to have that kind of expectations, they are bound to be disappointed, right? And you know what happens when you miss your earnings expectations, right? your stock price is just going to plummet, right? So it's very good, very important to manage that expectations. Do you think it's still a good idea nowadays in this day and age to raise your money through an IPO? Do you think so? It depends. What is your purpose of going to the market? IPO, right? Uh, of course, when you talk about IPO, there are two types. Whether it's an offer for sale or is it a public issue? Offer for sale means the existing shareholders are going to sell the shares. They're right? cash out now. They are cashing out, right? So that's no good. Good? Do you not think good, it's good? Not good. 
Do you good. think it's good? No, of course not. Of course not, right? right? So if it's a company that's <coughs> going IPO and it's a public issue, which means that the funds going to be raised for the companies, all right? Which means that the company is going to use the public funds, whether it's the expansion of the business, uh, going to new market, or growing, you know, or, or buying new bus- uh, new competitor or whatever, yeah, then, then it's a different picture. Yeah, so you got to ask yourself, why are you going public for? All right? Then the question is, uh, is this industry exciting, for example? All right? uh, or is this company um, uh, 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 an important IPO for the market, for example? All right? So, I mean, Malaysia has not seen very good IPOs uh, in the market. Uh, some small ones that came, yeah, they've done pretty well yeah, uh, because they're able to deliver earnings that are exciting. Uh, but most of it has been quite disappointing. Yeah? So again, the question of why are you going IPO? Why are you... Because today, being a public company, uh, the demand in terms of compliance, the, the demand in terms of, of making regulatory, uh, what do you call, uh, rec- standards, to meet the regulatory standards, not going to be easy. Yeah? There's a lot of demand. There's a compliance issue. There's listing uh, fees that you got to pay. Uh, everybody is watchful on you every quarter, right? whether you're going to meet expectations or not. Uh, so all that comes to play. Yeah? So that's the question, whether are you going to market to grow your business or are you just cashing out? Okay, so I guess you have to ask you the question. Okay, because Malaysia has been so unloved for the last two years. Correct. Why doesn't anybody love Malaysia? It boils down to valuation. It boils down to earnings growth. In fact, the last couple of years, uh, Malaysian corporates have been seeing negative earnings. All right? So what happens in negative earnings? Valuation becomes more and more expensive. So Malaysian market, although the market has dropped, coming to almost 20% from the top, uh, market still trading at 15 over times PE. You know? And 15 over times PE is still a premium compared to the other markets in the Asian region. Yeah? So the Malaysian market is still actually expensive in that sense. So w- when you were working for the family office, mm. um, for I think the Kunia owners, right? Yes. Kunia insurance owners, when yes. they sold the business, Correct. Um, what did you learn from that experience of managing a family office? As in, uh, like in family money, what were your experiences there? Not much different than how I was involved when managing the insurance funds. Yeah. Okay, so you're still buying into listed companies? Yes, yes. And but we, because uh, compared to where I was in Kunya Insurance, where uh, my scope of investment was pretty domestic. But uh, when I was with the family, I was able to expand uh, beyond the shores. Yeah? So I was able to invest in other markets, uh, different products as well. Uh, some are alternative products, some are structured products. Yeah? So that gave me experience in terms of uh, understanding global markets. Yeah. Okay, so I, so I guess then the, the, the next question really is, 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 there a, is there a set formula for people when you're at certain stages in the life, right? So when you're a fresh graduate, say 25 to 35, what is the formula, right? And then 35 to say 55, when you've got a little bit more um, um, uh, discretionary income or, or loose change, what are you going to do? Yeah. And then when you hit 55, so traditionally, if you're younger, you take more risk. Yeah. If you're older, you take less risk. Yeah, correct. Right? Is that the formula that people should consider? Uh, it is still very valid. I mean, this is what you call life cycle investing, right? Basically, when you're young, you don't have much. What do you do? All right? You got to save first for uh, perhaps you want to get married, you want to buy a house, you want to buy a car. Maybe a car is not important nowadays. I don't know. Most people take grab. Yeah? But, yeah. but the intention is to build your nest first. Yeah? Uh, but if you have the spare, obviously, you can start investing. Uh, you, if you are not well versed with the market, pass it on to asset managers. But that's the problem. Asset managers, they never beat the market. Nine out of ten of them won't beat the market. I agree. I agree. So yeah? why would you pay fees to someone who doesn't do as well as the market Yeah. Then, then the other alternative you have is to invest in ETFs. Yeah. But the sadly part about Malaysia is that our ETFs uh, are not really performing. You know, the liquidity is very dry. Yeah, uh, it doesn't reflect the market to a certain extent. Yeah, so I hope if the authorities can, can, can generate more momentum in this ETF world, uh, it will give a lot of uh, investors, especially those uh, who do not want to pass on to active managers, but to be investing in a passive manner. Okay. Because as you know, ETF, uh, cost of investment is a lot lower. 
Yeah, because you don't really pay a very high uh, management fees compared right, so to certain certain ETF funds in London. Uh, like for for, Black for free, or, or free, yeah, right, zero percent. Correct. Um. Okay. So if you're a young investor, say twenty five to thirty five, right? Um, and you're just starting out on your journey. Obviously, like most people, these guys, us, I was there one one time. We have very little bullets to 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 shoot, right? Yeah. And whatever bullets you shot, you have to make sure they hit the target or near the target, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't lose the money. You can't yeah, afford correct, to lose the correct, money, right? Correct. What's your advice to them? Well, you got to do a little bit of your own homework, all right. If you don't understand markets, learn, all right. Read, uh, try to understand what's happening. Try to understand what's valuation. Try to understand where the company is in terms of uh, whether it's in the right sector or whether the company is growing. What sort of dividend policy do they have? Uh, is it something that excites you? Right? Because at the end, investing is about ownership. Right? You own a company if you buy shares. Yeah? So if you have that understanding, then you begin to appreciate you know, a company's uh, uh, business. Uh, for example, if you, uh, like the telco sector I mentioned just now, right? if you feel that you are a Maxis subscriber, you like Maxis service, all right? look at Maxis shares. All right? Does it give you a good dividend? Is it a growth stock? It may not be a growth stock, but it gives you a good dividend. It's quite steady, right? It is well regarded. Yeah, so maybe you can put some money in there. Then if you look at banks, then you ask yourself, oh, which bank is exciting, right? Is it Maybank? Is it CIMB? Is it RMB? <laughs> I banks mean, excited now. Yeah, right. but of course, I mean, with, with the expectations that there's going to be a rate cut, you know, a lot of banks are under pressure. Yeah. yeah, so because your net interest margin will be squeezed, yeah, to a certain extent. Then we talk about consumer sector, you know, then you got to look at which one, which one is excites you or even REITs for that matter. Yeah, that gives you some dividend. Because at the end, you also want to make sure that you have protection. You don't want your a stock that you buy today is down 30% in, in two months time. You That's know? the last thing you want. Yeah, yeah, so you must have discipline as well, right? For example, one of the disciplines that you learn in stock investing is cut loss. How do you cut loss? Because everybody can buy stocks. The question is, how do you decide when you take profit? Or when do you cut loss? Right? Is it at 5% below your buying price? 10%? All right? There must be a certain threshold where you finally decide that that's it. I'm, I'm done with, with this stock. That's it. I'm going to cut loss. Right? So again, of course... Uh, that what are be, the rules for cut loss or cut gain? Well, normally the, 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 the mantra that people tell you is that you should cut loss if it's 10% below, provided the fundamentals have not changed. Right? If fundamentals have changed, then obviously you have to cut loss. Right? Uh, because if you believe in a company, for example, and the stock price is down by 10%, for example, but it's in fact, actually, it's cheaper for you to buy now. All right? If the fundamentals have not changed, you can actually average down if you want to. Right? And, but again, that decision depends on what is your outlook about the economy, about the sector, about the company. All right? Has that changed? Has that altered? If not, you just cut loss. What about, because um, you've only talked about the share market, Pankaj, what about the other markets, right? Would you advocate buying a property today? Would you advocate um, keeping cash and going traveling instead? Because that's another kind of value, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, of course, when you talk about investment, uh, the investment world is quite big. You know, it's not just not about the like, equity market. Yeah, you, you can, can even gold. buy bond. You can you buy, buy gold. gold right? You can buy, I wrote recently about uh, palladium. Right? Yeah, <laughs> industrial <laughs> Which, metals. Industrial metals, yeah. So even then, it doesn't generate any income. But if you look at the momentum of that metal, all right, it's there. Yeah, you can see that. Well, price has gone up quite a bit. Yeah, but the outlook is superb. Yeah, because it's yeah? used for in industrial applications. Yeah, yeah, catalytic converter for cars and all that. Yeah, yeah, and we are moving towards <coughs> more towards hybrid, towards electric. Yeah. So all this is going to come in terms of demand. Other than that, you can look into, like you say, property. Yeah, uh, property, of course. Would you advise your son to buy property nowadays in t- when he's when he turns twenty five? Uh, all depends. Yeah, I mean, you need a roof over your head first of all. If you already have that, then the question of do you want to buy for income? All right. Uh, in general. Uh, if you look at the market, yes, we have a huge overhang at the moment. Yeah, so location is very important. And to ensure that the property has got uh, a steady rental, all right? The rental may not be sufficient to cover yeah, your, your, your loan. Uh, then the question is, do you see that it's a good entry point, perhaps for you to hold in the future? 
that you're going to see capital appreciation, right? So if you have the funds, why not? Yeah, you can invest in properties, but you must make sure that the properties is yielding you uh, some income. Yeah, but the problem is with most kids. Um, I was that I was there at that time as well. Yeah, we don't have a lot of money, right? Yeah, so at 25, 35, I don't. You know, in fact, I um, think I, I didn't even get a save until I was in my early thirties. Yeah, yeah same, just, same year. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you you may you will save for your first property first. Right? But I think the idea about invest property investment will probably come in at a later stage of life. Yeah, maybe late thirties plus forties, or unless you know you made it you made it big somewhere, yeah, and you have a lot of funds, then obviously you gotta look at how you're gonna manage it. Yeah, whether you're gonna have more on the equity or more on property or other asset classes. Yeah. So then is there a recipe for the thirty five and above? Thirty five and above would be you want to grow your uh, what do you call wealth. Yeah, and that growth in wealth can come in many forms, whether it's equity, fixed income, property. So yeah. diversify lah. Yeah, you need to diversify. How yeah. did Pankaj Kumar do it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I I did a little bit of equity investments in the early years. Yeah, that helped me to build up my portfolio in terms of my not only my equity but also. Uh, in terms of my other assets, yeah, uh, including property, yeah. So I started building up my property portfolio, uh, maybe after my after the forties, after I was forties, yeah. So uh, that that actually helped, yeah, to for me to diversify away from just equity market. So my diversification was more towards three asset classes: cash, property, equity. Not much into fixed income, really. I mean, you know, I think Malaysian market was really not meant for individual investor to be buying into fixed income unless you are going to put it into a fund manager. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, fixed income is is a misnomer nowadays. Yeah. There, there is no fixed income, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just the central banks are playing with it. Fixed yeah, yeah, rate yeah, all the time. Correct. Correct. Um, what, in your opinion, is there a proposition for long term share market investing today? Because in the old days, remember, you used to buy Sime Derby or Guthrie's or whatever. Yeah. And you'd keep it for 30 years. Bobby Bank, keep it for 30 years, yeah. right? People are saying that's not the case anymore. Uh, I agree. It's not the case anymore. So you can't do you, that. You can't. Uh, you can't just buy a stock and think Home. that you can lock it up in your safe and, and, and you know, expect it to uh, 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 be a 10x or 100x in 10 years or 20 years' time. You know, it's not going to happen. So what you need to do Every time you buy a particular stock, you got to review your portfolio, yeah, whether it's on a quarterly basis or even annual basis, to see whether it still meets your investment objective, all right. In terms of whether the stock is performing, whether the company is performing, yeah, uh, whether it's it's still within your risk appetite, yeah. Uh, so all these comes into play. You got to review. You can't just buy and lock it up. In your opinion, is there a formula for like say you're forty years old, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, twenty percent equity, thirty-five percent property, fifty percent cash, or whatever, right? Today, uh, it's, today, it's very different. I, I think every individual have different perspective. Uh, it depends where you are uh, financially, and what you intend to achieve. Yeah. What is your investment goal? What is your target? And of course, some people say, you know, I don't really, in what, fact... What, what is your target? <laughs> because everybody, everybody has a number, right? Yeah, everybody has a number. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so in their mind, it's like locked in the bag in some department. Well, some people, I mean, I don't mind sharing with you. Some people will say, you know, I, why would I want to invest? EPF is doing all the job for me. No, so the retirement number, right? Because yeah. everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to retire when I hit this uh, 5 million or 10 million or 3 million or whatever yeah. million, right? Yeah, so everybody has a different number, yeah. Yeah, what was your, do you... <laughs> I don't have a number. Yeah. You I don't, don't have, have a number? number? I don't have a, I have a, my number, but I can't, I can't really tell you what's my number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what dictates the number? What should dictate okay, the Okay, what should dictate your number is what is the income that you need when Let's say on an annual basis or a, on a monthly basis, all right? Annualize it, all right? So let's say if you need 100,000, for example. Just, just, or just say like your, monthly, your monthly requirements when you're... Yeah, okay, so let's say you need 10,000 a month, for example. Okay. All right, that's 120,000, all right? To generate that 120,000, let's say just on a... Uh, this is what you call the, the, the 4% rule, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. 4%. Yeah, 4%. Yeah, yeah, something so like 2. that. So 2.5 million? Uh. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, right. so if you think that is sufficient for you, 
right? Every individual is different. Eh? For some individual, it could be 1,000 ringgit. For some individual, it could be 10,000 a month. Some individual could be 100,000 a month. I don't know. Yeah. All right? So if you think 10,000 is enough, then your magic number is that 2.5 million. Yeah, because 4, 4%. Yeah, is, correct. Is you, can your... easily, you can easily generate that income and live on that income. And because leaving you your principal in, you aside. Live, you live in an FDA. Correct. It uh, gives you 4%. Yeah. That's your 10,000 a month. Correct. If you have 2.5 million. Correct. Okay. Um, so so here you are on the other side of the hill, like like I am as well. <laughs> <laughs> Left the corporate world. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do now? Well, I'm still quite active, I must say. Uh, in fact, there are days I'm more busy than I was before even because of deadlines. Uh, as you know, I do some writing. In the star, uh, so that keeps me going. I got to think of what to write every week. Uh, other than that, I do a little bit of training uh, for people who are in the financial market. So I conduct what we call as continuous professional education. So I conduct classes on corporate governance, on ethics, on uh, valuation, and about stock market. I even have a class talking about ETFs. Yeah, so these are some of the things that I do. Uh, I just came back from another session uh, earlier today. I was a moderator uh, at an event uh, talking about corporate liability. Uh, that's another class that I have as well, uh, talking about corporate liability. Yeah, so these are things that I, I keep myself busy uh, and keep myself occupied. Yeah, because there comes a time in everybody's lives when, and, and you know, life has a habit of going too far sometimes, right? Yeah, correct. When you're young, it goes damn bloody slow. Yeah. Then once you hit your 30s, it starts, it starts to accelerate. Yeah. Once it hits the 40s, it starts to speed along. Yeah. yeah. Once you hit 50, it's just like, it's ultrasound, right? <laughs> Ultra speed. Um, what is your philosophy in terms of life after work? I think you need to have balance, all right? Okay. And I think I learned this idea about having a balanced life. Maybe when I hit about 45, I realized that I was too engrossed at work uh, to the extent that I neglected certain things. Such as? Uh, health. Yeah. So, working too hard? Yeah. Working, working too, too hard? hard without uh, taking care of oneself. No, didn't eat properly, things like that? Not about food, but more about exercise. All right. And I think I had a conscious uh, decision to start doing that more uh, and I started at the age of 45 I started to exercise a bit more in fact uh, between the age of 30 to 45 I probably hardly exercise maybe once a week but after I hit 45 I started doing more so what are you doing you're doing marathons now uh, I did really yes yeah. I did uh, at the age of 45 as I said I had I had three goals to achieve in the next five years, when I was 45, I had three goals to achieve. One was uh, to climb the Mount Kinabalu. Okay. Second was Which to run done, a marathon. Sure. Which you've done, I'm sure. Second was to run a marathon. Yeah. And third was to take an MBA. Oh, okay. So in that five years, between 45 to 50, I managed to complete all three. Yeah. And that took a lot of discipline, especially the marathon. Yeah. Uh, full marathon or half marathon? Full marathon. I did four half marathons. And I did one full marathon. Oh, yo. Yeah. Oh, yo. Which one was it? Uh, Singapore Stand Chart. Oh, yes. Yeah. In fact, it was a ridiculous thing because I actually signed up for KL Stand Chart, the full marathon. But that year we had haze. You know? so and I was already in training, you know. <laughs> and I said, I told my wife, I said, oh, God, you know, I'm already in training and I need to run a marathon, but the marathon is cancelled here because of the haze. I need to find a marathon to run. It wasn't as if Singapore was not hazy. Uh, no, but timing. Because Malaysian KL Marathon was September, Singapore Marathon was December. Okay, so yeah, so, by then. so I had enough time to sign up myself <laughs> yeah, for the Singapore Marathon. So, so I went so, down to Singapore to run the marathon. So what was your time? 5.12. That's alright. Yeah. That is really alright. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so how did you feel? Great. Yeah. Uh, in fact, my target was below five hours, but sadly enough, I couldn't, I couldn't meet that target. But so, it's okay, so It Doesn't matter. Well, what's your time for half marathon? My best is two o six. That is really good. Yeah, <laughs> my best is two o six. Okay, so that's not bad. Yeah. So you you had it in you all this time. Uh, I built it up. Uh, in fact, as I said, at the age of forty five, I started running. I couldn't even run five km, right? I slowly built it up, uh, to run the distance. And my first target was to do a half marathon. So once Actually, I finished the half marathon, then I said to myself, I said, maybe I should try a full marathon. 
Yeah, because now when I look at you, you do actually resemble Elliot Kipchoge. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he does that in he does one hour fifty nine for full marathon. For the full marathon, that's yeah, crazy, yeah, man. Yeah, that's crazy. crazy. So you done Kinabalu? Yeah, I've done Kinabalu as what well. What was that like? Yeah, that was great. Coming to the top uh, with the sunrise and all that—that that was fantastic. Yeah. Which is so? Which is harder, climbing the mountain or doing the marathon? Marathon. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. The mountain, I finished it within a year. I was practicing mountains and all that. I managed to get it, get it done and over with. Yeah. Yeah. Then I started a bit more on the running. In fact, I still run. Uh, I still run about at least three times a week. Yeah. Uh, to keep myself uh, fit as well as active. Uh, so I still run small races, 10 km here and there, yeah. So that just keeps me going. But I'm not going to do another marathon. I'm done with. I'm done. Oh really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You should continue, man. Yeah, because it le- requires a lot of discipline. I mean, you got to get up you like. Gotta, you got to keep in shape, lah. Yeah, you got keep in shape is one thing, but you got to cover the distance. Yeah. Yeah, in training. Yeah, because if you are running for a marathon, you got to clock at least about 50 kilometers a week, just you to hit the top. Yeah, to hit the distance, you need to hit 50 kilometers uh, before you can say you are ready for a marathon. So what's going to be next? Because, okay, so mountain <laughs> is easy, right? Because you can just keep on going higher. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Marathons, you can just keep on doing, or you can do well, an you can do ultra. You can do an yeah. Ironman. Yeah, yeah, but I'm right? not, I'm not, I'm not into ultra. that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not into so that. what's next? What's next? I, I feel that uh, it'd be good if I just keep going, yeah, in terms of the distance that I'm doing now. Uh, I can do... Of course, 10km, not a problem, because I run about 7km every other day. Um, running a half marathon is not going to be difficult, but full marathon is going to be difficult, yeah? so, because that requires a lot more training. Uh, so I'll just keep my momentum going, uh, just to keep myself active yeah? and healthy at the same time. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the thing about um, life nowadays, right? Yeah. Because a lot of people our age um, are starting to fall sick. Yeah. Right. They're working too hard. Correct. Getting stressed out. Yeah. Heart attacks, strokes, yeah. cancers, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you heard it uh, a lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot of friends. Yeah. A lot of peers. Um, how are you? What are you doing to mitigate against that? Yeah. That's why I said you need to have a balance. Yeah. Uh, to of course, you will know whether you are, uh, what do you call, uh, healthy. Even uh, even guys in the thirties are. Yeah. Yeah. It right? happens because if you are not careful and if you are if you do not have symptoms especially yeah. that's going yeah, to hurt a lot you. of them are invisible right yeah so invisible. how are you advising your son your son is 15 years old daughter oh sorry your daughter yeah. okay this is even more interesting how are you <laughs> advising her uh she's very young but she's quite active as well uh in terms of sports see she loves handball actually out of all sports she's okay with running uh, she has picked up a bit but not to the distance that i'm doing uh, so she can easily run about three or four km not not a problem yeah, at her own her pace, yeah. So well, what's she loves advice, the outdoor. What's your advice to her on 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 career paths? What do you tell her nowadays? Uh, do, you, do, I, you, do, you, do you tell her to do traditional finance or parenting you, today is very different in those days? You know. That's right. Yeah. So tell so me about that. I leave it to her. Uh, in fact, she knows. Uh, she has a certain particular interest at the moment. Uh, she loves animals. Yeah, uh, of course, cats and dogs. Yeah, so she wants to be a vet. Yeah, so I'm. I do encourage her if she wants. She's interested on in that field, uh, but of course it all depends on the grades that she can get and all that. Yeah, and if she can get to the schools that she wants to. Yeah, but I think being a vet is good, and I think uh, that will actually give her her own satisfaction Are because I think it's very important that she enjoys it. Right? No, 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 yeah, and you enjoy it, passion. Yeah. yeah. All right, and. I remember too, I told you when I was 12 years old, my passion was stock market. So the passion actually built my career. Yeah? So I think for her, if her passion is about animals, so be it. Are you a hands-on parent? What, what, what's the, um, an optimal par- parenting style? I think there are different stages of life uh, as far as how do you parent, how do you practice your parenting. Yeah? When your child is still an infant and growing up, you know, that, that toddler age and then or the primary school age and then the teenage age right? so it's different so your daughter's in teenage years yeah now, she's right? in the teenage age so so, <laughs> 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 so some more daughter right yeah uh, so it's machine gun time la. Uh, I think she knows her parameters uh, 
uh, objective in life, objective in you know uh, what is important now for her. Uh, she knows that she has to do reasonably well, yeah, to to pursue the the career that she's aspiring to be, you know, to be a vet. Okay, so she's quite a quite a good girl, la. Yeah, good girl, good girl, la. Good girl la. Was it because of active parenting, or was it you're quite laissez faire about it? I think, as I said, it's different stage of her her. Uh, so you just read it as it was, and then you yeah, applied. correct, correct, right, right. correct. But I'm quite close to her, uh, especially in the last couple of years, uh, because now that I'm no longer working, I spend more time with her, uh, you know, sending her, fetching her, and all that. Yeah, so that that actually helps a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And in fact, a lot of her friends know me, you know, pretty well. Yeah. Really? So oh, yeah, it's quite cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, so sometimes so say, oh, yeah, Uncle Pankaj, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 very, yeah, we come yeah. by your house. Uh, no lah, no la. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they, I'll fetch yeah, give them. Give me some stop tips, la, Yeah, it? so I'll fetch them sometimes because my daughter say, hey, "Can you fetch this friend of mine? She needs to go back." I like, yeah, yeah, can, can. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so what's what's your read of the next ten years for Malaysia? I think Malaysia is going through a very exciting phase. Uh, we have seen the change in government. Um, the issue here is about setting the stage for the country going forward. Yeah. Uh, while Pakatan is trying to do that, but execution has been rather uh, poor. Um, I worry about Malaysia in terms of race and religion issues, uh, which I think uh, this government was not voted for. This government was voted for governance. This government There's was a lot voted. There's now for this Pakatan national thing. Right? Yeah, I agree. But I I don't buy the idea uh, because, as I said, uh, when Malaysians all Malaysians uh, went to the polls uh, on May 9th, uh, 2018. Um, our, the, the, the call for change of the government was driven by governance issues, by setting the stage right in terms of putting the country you know, forward. Uh, but we are going back to you know, issues that is disrupting us. Yeah, uh, we are not setting the stage economically in terms of where we want to take the country forward. Uh, I think the most important thing is to address uh, some of the shortcomings that we have seen before, especially in terms of education, right? Um, and ensuring that our young are well educated in terms of uh, the subjects that they are taking in the schools and making learning interesting again and teaching them uh, what is good, what is bad, right? I think governance and, and um, ethics today is very important, yeah? Uh, I think if you talk to some of the corporates, uh, trust is very important. Uh, some of these soft skills are not taught in our schools, right? We are very much driven by academic subjects, but we are not taught about issues related to ethics, what is right, what is wrong, about governance, um, and you know, ensuring that we become good citizens. Uh, so I think that's important. So to wrap up, um, let's play some, some quick fire questions, right? <laughs> uh, words of advice. What are three pieces of, of advice you would give to the um, 30 year old? For his career? I think if you are 30 year old, you probably already start working, right? So obviously you got to know where you are at your workplace, uh, where do you stand, all right? Are you in the right company in terms of your career prospect? Uh, are you paid reasonably well compared to your peers? Uh, do you enjoy what you're doing? Is that your passion, all right? Uh, I think doing what you like most is is important because it gives you satisfaction, right? I always tell people, don't worry about the money. If you do things- It's hard, hard to put in practice, right? Yeah, but it can, it can come, right? If you do well in terms of your job, what you are doing, if your current employee doesn't appreciate it, some other people will appreciate it sooner or later, right? Other people can see as well, all right? So it can come. Uh, you may not be paid that well today, but you may be paid well in the future. So it's very important to continue to do what is right and show your passion in, in, in terms of your work performance, right? 
and be committed as well as discipline. Uh, I think a lot of young people today, uh, they feel that if the working hours is 9 to 5, you know, they're not going to work anything beyond 5 o'clock, for example, all right? which is wrong. I think it's important to uh, show that you are passionate about your job. You are, you are keen to learn. Go beyond what is your job responsibility. All right? Ask for more work, for example. It gives you, it gives you responsibility. It gives you, you know, the energy to, to, to learn. Yeah. What of advice for the 40-year-old? 40 year old. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we Make sure you have your house in order, firstly. We, we were all there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you have your house in order. Yeah, start planning for your retirement. Yeah. Start uh, thinking then. Yeah, start yeah. thinking because it's important to start early. Uh, I mean, if you start talking about retirement at the age of 50, too then late. too late. Too yeah. Late. Uh, <laughs> as you know, time value of money is very important. Yeah. So if you start as early as you can, set aside what you can if you if you have that extra set it aside set it aside and start learning about investment start learning about how to put your money to work for you yeah uh, if you do not understand if you're not in the finance field learn right read uh, today you have a lot of opportunity to uh, to read uh, in the internet or whatever yeah about other people's success in the investment world you know how they do it yeah, so that can give you some perspective. And then the 50-year-old guy? The 50-year-old person. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a guy. 50-year-old person. 50-year-old person, yeah. I think you, you can start looking forward in terms of what you're going to do in retirement. Nice, yeah? right? Life after work. Life after work, yeah. I think it's important to have balance. Uh, taking care so of your okay health. So not be balanced when you're young? Come again? So it's okay to not be balanced when you're young? That, that's not right either. It's right? not right either, but... Maybe your work commitment uh, needs you to be a bit more. I mean, I as I told you, I used to work fourteen hours a day. Yes, I yeah, so I have no choice. All of us did. Yes, yeah, so so you see, as you as you age and as you progress in your career, you have that option. You can say, okay, you know, I think I have enough of this. You know, I, time for me to make your time. Like as I mentioned just now, at the age of forty-five, I decided to make time for it. Right, for example, to go for my runs. All right, to exercise. Yeah, I make sure I allocate that time, that 45 minutes, an hour, enough. So what do you make of kids nowadays at you know, 25 or 28 years old, and they want it all, right? They want to have their balance, they want to have their own business, they want to have a high salary. Is it unrealistic? Well, all of us wants everything, right? It's well, not, we, not well, possible. No, in one the real life doesn't give you that. In one generation, it's changed though, the mentality, right? The, the, the kids nowadays... They want to go traveling, right? Yeah, they want yeah. to see the world. Correct. They want to also have yeah, a career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never thought yeah, of we having, never thought. right? We I said, agree. Yeah. We work, 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 and yeah, then yeah. Uh, if we can afford it, we'll get married. If we don't, we'll just keep on working. Yeah, yeah correct. We never thought of that. We never thought, yeah. Um, you know, Port Dixon or, or Malacca, <laughs> maybe, right? Definitely not London, <laughs> yeah, right? No. <laughs> Definitely not, like, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree, I agree. Uh, the, the perspective of the generation today like you mentioned, the 25, 35 is different than what we used to be. Yeah, uh, they feel that... So if your daughter in 10 years time, she, yeah. right, how, how would you respond? I think as parent, you will leave it to your child. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's up to her really. I mean, if she wants to do what she wants, if she thinks it's something that she feels satisfied for it, it's up to her really. I think parenting today is very different than our, our time. Okay. Yeah, uh, we don't dictate what our children should do. Yeah, we can advise them, but at the end of it, it's their decision. Yeah. To the sixty-year-old person, enjoy life. All right, I think it's time to uh, start uh, looking back as to what you have uh, Take done. Stop. Yeah, Take done. Stop. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, start enjoying life. Travel a bit. Yeah. Uh, reconnect with your old friends. I think a lot of us do that as well nowadays. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Kids you haven't seen for like well, people you haven't seen for a long time. Like, oh, hello, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean Facebook is one way we, yeah. we get to know a lot of people that we, we have forgotten for the past thirty years. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. So I think this is what they call how life treats you along the way. Well, it's interesting, right? Because uh, now you can continue to work until you're very old. Yeah, um, you can. I mean if Prime Minister um, is ninety five years old. Right. So, so he sets the standard for everybody else. Yeah. Um, definitely I don't think I'll stop working 
definitely I want a balance um, definitely I think if you stop working your your mind will die yeah. and then you will yourself die I agree right? I agree. I mean look at Kuan Yu right Kuan Yu until his, he was in his late 80s yeah, yeah. he never advocated stopping work correct correct uh, ever yeah I, I believe that too uh, there are different level of what is defined as work and if you're a market investor yeah. look at Stan Druckenmiller, Miller look at Warren Buffett yeah. look at Charlie Munger yeah, look at yeah, all yeah. these guys right I mean, they're sharp as nails. Yeah, yeah, correct. Every day they're correct. reading, what, yeah. 300 annual reports? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Crazy, yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's fantastic. Yeah, but that, that keeps you active as well. Yeah. I mean, even in my case, uh, every morning I'm going through reports, I'm going through what's yeah. happening in the market, yeah. I read, yeah, yeah uh, because I need to get perspective of what's Actually, happening. Actually, that's what I'm looking forward to. You know, yeah. when you got a bit more time, then you spend like the morning analyzing. Yeah, correct. Right? And then you do something. Yeah, right? correct. You, you act on it, right? Yeah, yeah, you act you, on you, it. You, yeah. Your typical buy, sell, or hold, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, in the afternoon, you can go and work out. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. fantastic, right? Yeah, yeah. But normally I go for my run first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, brother. All right, thank, thank you. you for coming. Thanks, thanks, John. Fantastic talking thanks, to John. you. Pleasure and a privilege. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>